Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, July 18th, 2022. Coming up on the show today, from the Baz Luhrmann film Elvis, editor Matt Villa. I got a news headline saying that the hotel on the Gold Coast was the first place that a COVID case had been detected. And I remember saying to the director of the film that I was working on, wow, I'm pretty sure that's where the cast and crew of Elvis are staying. <laughs> editor Jonathan Redmond. While we're betraying a time which was over 50 years ago, he didn't want it to feel that way. He wanted to feel contemporary, visceral. He wanted to kind of decode Elvis's music for a younger audience. And sound designer Wayne Pashley. Baz said to me, what we're making is the great American operatic tragedy. And the second thing he said to me, you must protect Elvis Presley. Yes, all that and a lot more in this edition of The Rough Cut. Right, showtime. Hi there, my friends. Thanks for dropping by the old rough cut. I hope you're enjoying your summer so far. Or if you live in Australia where they made the movie Elvis, I hope you're enjoying your winter. How about that? And maybe the fact that we're talking about Elvis today will help you enjoy both even more. I know it worked for me. I really like this movie. I really like Elvis, so that was a big plus going in to see it. But you don't have to know much about Elvis or be a fan of his music to enjoy this film. That said, by the time you're done watching it, you'll definitely have learned a few things about him, and chances are you'll come out of it with a greater appreciation of him, if not his music. I certainly think you'll come away with an appreciation for the editing and the sound work, which is why we have those folks on the show today. On the picture editing side, we have Matt Villa and Jonathan Call Me John O. Redmond. And on the sound side, we have Wayne Pashley, who is the re-recording mixer, sound designer, supervising sound editor. You know, those roles are so often lumped together that they definitely need a shorter name for when that happens, you know, like head sound mofo or something. It's too hard to read all those off. Maybe we'll just go with the sound designer for now, and you can assume re-recording mixer and supervising sound editor as well, unless notified otherwise. Yeah, there you go. All three of these talented individuals have worked with Baz Luhrmann before. They all worked on The Great Gatsby together, and Wayne, head sound mofo Wayne Pashley, that is, goes all the way back with Luhrmann to his first film, Strictly Ballroom. And I was living in Australia when that movie came out, and I can tell you, you could not get away from it. It was a national phenomenon. It was just huge. And also the beginning of a journey that would lead Mr. Lerman all the way to today's featured attraction, Elvis. So much to talk about on this one, but first, a quick word from our opening act. The wonderful folks at Extreme Music who helped to sponsor this podcast with the post team from Elvis. Now, how can we talk about the movie Elvis without just laying it right out there that music is everything to a movie, whether it's about the king of rock and roll or not? For the Elvis movie, they had an incredible catalog of iconic rock hits to choose from. You may not be so fortunate. That's why you need Extreme Music. They, too, have an incredible catalog of tunes to choose from. And they make it so easy for you to do the choosing. You can search on just about anything to do with music. The lyrics, the tempo, the style, the instruments, any keywords. You could search on things like Memphis, Rockabilly, 50s, and they would get right back to you with some great tracks that match those keywords. You could even take a song you already have and give it to them. Don't worry, they'll give it back. Plus, they'll give you back tracks from their catalog that match it. I tell you, once you try it, you can't help falling in love with extreme music. And if you think that's the last Elvis joke I'm dropping today, you clearly don't know me. But knowing me is not important. The ones you've got to know when it's time to find the best music for your next film or TV project is those musical geniuses at Extreme Music. Tell them I sent you. That ought to be funny. Matt Fury. Who the hell is Matt Fury? All right, let's dim the lights. Let's raise the curtain. Cue the band because it is time to talk about Elvis. Please welcome to the stage Matt Villa, John O'Redmond, and Wayne Pashley. If you guys have any pointed remarks about Jason, they're always welcome. <laughs> He's earned every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've all worked with Baz Luhrmann before. What I thought we would do is we would start with how you first met Mr. Luhrmann, and then for fun, just what's your favorite Elvis song? So, uh, Wayne, you want to kick us off? Oh, sure. Uh, well, thanks, Matt, for inviting us along for this chat about Elvis. I first met Baz Luhrmann on Strictly Ballroom. So uh, our relationship goes back 30 years now, because this is the 30th anniversary of Strictly Ballroom. Uh, and wonderfully, they've actually just um, re- redone the uh, film in 4K, which is great, and have re-released it. So it's quite extraordinary that in the same year that Elvis has been released, so has Strictly Ballroom. So that was uh, my first introduction to Baz. Obviously, that was his first film. And I remember thinking uh, this guy was an absolute force of nature and a whirlwind. And I was recording crowds, the Loop Group crowds, for Strictly, and Baz turned up, which is very unusual for a director to turn up for loop group recording and he threw himself into the crowd and and started to to perform with them i was just i was just amazed you know and so that was that was how we started 
That's a pretty good intro. <laughs> How about a favorite Elvis song? Oh, gee, you know, I've got so many. I, I've loved Elvis, like, forever. The first song I ever heard was in my father's car on an AM radio, and I, oh, gee, I must have only been about six or something, and it was Return to Sender. Now, that has a, so that has a very, uh, you know, a resonant uh, sort of impact for me, you know, because uh, that was, I just thought this was the coolest song ever, and I was, like, about seven. <laughs> Pretty good taste for a seven-year-old. <laughs> well, let's break up the Australian accents a little bit. Jono, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> I first met Baz, uh, I think it was the year 2000. I was a first assistant on Moulin Rouge, which was an amazing project to uh, to work on and quite an introduction to uh, to Mr. Lerman and his team. That's also, incidentally, where I met Matt Villa, uh, who also worked on Moulin Rouge. So we've kind of known and worked together uh, since then. Um, and Wayne uh, as well. I think would have met you back then through the post process. Yeah, well, yeah, I was, I was sort of, I was in amongst uh, uh, Babe too at the time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In terms of my favorite Elvis song, I kind of grew up with Elvis's music everywhere, uh, mostly used in TV ads selling ice creams and stuff like that. So it was, it was kind of the wallpaper to my youth, but I was never a huge fan. But the one song that always cut through to me, even with that aside, was In the Ghetto. And I just always, always, always loved that song and, uh, and still do. But, uh, you know, kind of, we've been kind of listening to Elvis music now for five years. And, you know, I, I definitely have a newfound appreciation of his music, particularly kind of understanding the background to Elvis's music and, and how radical and how important uh, he's been to uh, many contemporary musicians that that I, I also love and admire. I think anecdotally, you guys are going to help create a new generation of Elvis fans because I'm seeing that pop up everywhere. The kids going to see this movie. That's what I'm and loving. discovering this music. Yeah. All right, Matt. Uh, well, as John, I mentioned, I first met Baz on uh, Moulin Rouge. I was very fortunate back then to, that was right in the in the period of time where we were making the transition Kind of from from non from film to nonlinear film editing. So, uh, Moulin Rouge had a uh, a nonlinear department and a film department. So we had a running conform throughout the course of post production film conform. So I was part of the film first assisting team back then, which was uh, which sort of lasted a, a couple of years, a couple of projects for myself. There was always the 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 avid team, or in the case of Moulin Rouge, the uh, the Lightworks team, and then the film conform team. And I then moved on to being uh, the visual effects editor on the film as well. So it's kind of like a, a bit of a dual role as the as the film continued. And I first met Baz. I remember the first time I ever laid eyes on Baz was in the uh, the initial pre production meeting. And there was this gigantic table uh, in a gigantic boardroom on the Fox lot in Sydney. And he sat at the head of the table. And that was the first time of many times to come where I saw him just command an audience. And just, you know, impart all of his knowledge and all of his vision on all of these heads of department. And that was the first day I ever met him and immediately could see what this guy was about. He was just, uh, he knew exactly what vision he had and just articulated it beautifully. We just went through the entire script and he totally said scene by scene what, what each scene was going to be. And it was just extraordinary. And, uh, and that's the guy I've gone on to, we, we've all gone on to know and love. He's, he's never, never without an idea or 20, um, and he's never without a, an incredibly entertaining way of imparting that information onto you. So that, yeah. that was a... Totally agree with all that. Yeah. And favourite song, so many. A lot like Jono, I was I sort of uh, growing up, I only really ever knew Elvis as, the, as the, the goofy guy in the movies or the Vegas years, but I always sort of liked his early... Uh, that, that was the Elvis that I knew, but I knew, knew the songs of earlier years. So there's so many. I mean, I'd think maybe uh, one song that springs to mind would be Don't Be Cruel. I do love that, that song for, from the early years, and sadly uh, we weren't able to actually get that into the film anywhere, but, uh, which is always a bit sad. But, um, but I think If I Can Dream would have to be another one. Uh, it just, it's just, mm. uh, it just mm. yeah, punches you in the heart, that song, each time you hear it. There's no way you could have gotten all the songs in. Unfortunately, you didn't get Don't Be Cruel in. For my money, trying to get to you from the 68 comeback special. And even though you, that was a big part in the film, yeah. that song didn't make it mm. in. So <laughs> We did film it, though. Did you really? 
possibly watch this space because I do know just in the last day <laughs> that scene was sent to Bez. Yeah. So uh, it may potentially pop up on a on social media somewhere. Else. <laughs> I would love that. There's an exclusive. Yeah. I was talking to Baz a couple of days ago about that, just on text message. Mm. You know, if I had to um, if I had to describe this film in one word, and that's virtually impossible, that word would be lush. And I think if you do like a Venn diagram of Elvis and Baz Luhrmann, Lush would be where their styles intersect. At least yeah. that's my take anyway. Yeah. And if you've seen any of Luhrmann's previous films, and I know you all have, the style of this film or the emphasis on style should not come as a complete surprise. Still, I'd like to know what Baz told each of you about what he wanted the styles of the soundscape and also the visuals to be. So Wayne, let's start with you and hear about the soundscape that you had to build for this film. Yeah, uh, well, well, when uh, we first had our brief, it was actually in 2019 before the pandemic kicked in in such a horrific way, and uh, we had a we had a meeting um, upstairs in the studio here, and and had some lunch and stuff, and it was kind of amazing because he he or he was I hadn't read the script, and he was pitching the movie, and as he was going forward, uh, I was kind of you know, getting a little confused because I, was, I then asked him, I said, so what are we doing? Are we just taking a slice of Elvis's life, uh, you know, in a, in a certain period uh, or, or what? And he said, no, 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 we're doing his whole life. <laughs> and uh, sort of my head span off, you know, in the shoulders at that point. And I started to think about, you know, my mind was reeling thinking about, so what is Elvis? Elvis is the music, clearly. Uh, it's the crowds. It's you know, the, and the love of the crowds. And it's the cars and it's all of that sort of that sex and that, that you know, and all that sort of stuff that Elvis did at that time. And it also was the controversy of what he did in that period of uh, the racial segregation in the South and all that sort of stuff. And so we started to think about the 50s, 60s and 70s. And Baz said to me, what we're making is the great American operatic tragedy. And the second thing he said to me, you must protect Elvis Presley. That was the deal. And in terms of the sonic architecture, throughout the film, across the three decades, he wanted everything to be in harmony, but it was going to be a weave, a little like a mosaic, where all the pieces will come together as a whole. Now, that the weave is not only with the sound design and the music to be a singular vision, it has to be with all departments. That included the editorial, production design, whether it's makeup, costume, everything. Everyone had to be in harmony, but we'll never to sit on one idea. It's got to keep moving and we've got to keep it transitional. Because he was basically taking such a huge life story and truncating it into a two and a half hours, that how long it is, film, and being a montage heavy narrative, the weave and the transitions had to be completely flowing and not be jagged. That was the brief. And that's what we attempted to do, is to work with the story and the characters and as they work through those decades. And one of the things we did, which we'll probably get to with the editorial guys, they started a process that was called poetic glue. So the poetic glue, visually, these guys can talk more to that, was a way of truncation, but also uh, visually staying on your toes, never letting it sit too long. From poetic glue came sonic glue. And the sonic glue became the transitions. How were we going to transition? And with that, we decided to put in a narrative on top of the narrative. So in the atmospherics or the backgrounds, it's a native Dolby Atmos mix, but within the ceilings and in the walls of the cinema, there are voices that come and go throughout the main narrative portions of the film. So uh, a bit of a shout out to Barbara Harris, who was our Loop Group um, casting agent, and all her team. We recorded real quotes, real commentary and headlines from the day, from the period. So within that infrastructure, there is all this dialogue, whether it's Hank Snow referring to the Colonel and his relationship, or whether it's talking about the Vietnam War, or whether it's talking about Elvis's successes and gold records, all that stuff is happening in sections throughout the film to create tension for the characters. One day I'd like to just release the sonic glue so you can hear it. But basically that became a huge event because legally 
because it was real, real live quotes that uh, Barbara's team did, that all had to be cleared. So you can imagine what the Warner's legal department was like dealing with that. But so that was how we did it. That's how we decided to tackle the cross-cultural landscapes of the, of the three periods of Elvis's life. Okay, guys. Wayne teed you up with that old picture glue. <laughs> Please tell me about what you talked about with Baz in terms of your visual style. Well, there was always the three periods of Elvis's life. There was the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And, and if we're if to, to focus down on the montage and the glue aspect of it all, one of the big things that Brez always wanted to tackle was to reflect those, you know, any, any sort of montage or any kind of sequence like that, to give it a look of the period that it came from. So the 50s, you know, is obviously very much a, a montage based on superimpositions and overlays and that kind of thing. The 60s had the really cool graphics whizzing around and use of different fonts and things like that. And the 70s was based very heavily on split screens, which was not only a device at the time, you know, with the Thomas Crown Affair and those kinds of films, but also Elvis, the Elvis concert documentaries themselves were very split screen heavy. So that was kind of the basis of it. But we, uh, we then were always given the brief, make it plus, make it a 50s montage plus, a 60s montage plus, and a 70s montage plus. So it was always the... So John and I would, would put together, uh, you know, f- form those kind of things up, form those, those ideas up conceptually and, and from a content standpoint. But it became such, a, such an event, each of those montages became such an event unto themselves that uh, we did have to come uh, bring in some help. A girl by the name of Annika Damon came in who was, uh, uh, lived up on the Gold Coast in Queensland where we were cutting. And she came in and from a technical standpoint, put all that sort of stuff together and certainly brought her own uh, ideas to it. Um, but uh, that, was, that was the brief, just make it 50s plus, 60s plus and 70s plus. Mm. The deluxe version. Yeah. <laughs> I think the guys have kind of covered most of the, the, the important uh, topics there. But one other important uh, point Baz made about the style of the movie uh, from very early on was he didn't want it to be romantic. While we're betraying a time which is over 50 years ago, he didn't want it to feel that way. He wanted to feel contemporary, visceral. He wanted to kind of decode Elvis's music, how he looked for a younger audience. Baz does this quite a bit in some of his other films. Greg Gatsby, he used hip hop in, in terms of jazz to basically kind of let a younger audience know how kind of radical this music was. Gatsby in the 20s, it was jazz. In, in our movie now, Elvis's music in the 50s was pretty out there. You know, audiences had never heard that before. And how do you do that to a younger audience who mightn't be that kind of wowed by an early Elvis song? So uh, from a style point of view, kind of making sure it was contemporary and visceral was, was very important for, for Baz. And he made that very clear. When you do a movie about an iconic singer, or at least one whose voice and music is very well known around the world, you have some decisions to make about how you do the music. Do you use the original? Do you have the actor or a voice double do it? Uh-huh. You take a hybrid approach. You look at films like Great Balls of Fire for Jerry Lee Lewis, Rocketman with Elton John, Bohemian Rhapsody, Freddie Mercury. They all did it a little differently, somewhat with how accessible the original vocal tracks are. Yeah. It's probably harder when you're going back to the 50s with Elvis. Tell me how you approach this unique challenge for doing the music for Elvis. Well, we had an incredible music team, number one, led by Elliot Wheeler, composer. We had Jamison Shaw uh, as music editor and also one of the producers, the music producers. There were so many people. So first of all, Elliot Wheeler was really on this picture for five years. So since at the end of The Great Gatsby through to now, he was on the picture for that long. And I think Jamison Shaw was possibly with him for equally as long. So they did all their work. I mean, that's a whole other meeting you could have with them about where they recorded. They were down in Nashville. They were in the original studios Elvis was at. They were recorded all the, the authentic sort of voices, you know, down in the South. So that I won't talk to that area because that's massive in itself. But for myself, the first introduction was in to the musical approach to practically make the film was in December 2019. I went up to the Gold Coast where the the sets were being built at the time and I first met Austin Butler and we had set up a very basic sort of set, you know, with a bit of lighting, with camera. The music team was set up there and we had David Lee, our sound 
location sound recordist. David, I've worked with many times before, and he had a Scorpio sort of rig set up. He had 32 channels available. On that particular day, it was all about sync. Okay, let's do a sync playback test. Everyone, we met um, Austin, hi, hi, hi. We got a Shaw 55 microphone into the situation, and we basically did playback in through David Lee's rig and tested the playback. So this was in the morning, and we thought, yep, okay, sync is good, camera was rolling, and that was what it was all about. As we went along, we started to add more complexity into the recording situation. So Austin then started to sing, like he started to vocally go along with him. So we had an in-ear piece, we had the playback, and we started to get his vocals going. And we thought, okay, so that's test two. And that was amazing. We thought, wow, this guy can sing Elvis, right? So that was, so around lunchtime, Baz came in to say hi to everyone. How's the sync check going? And we played him the, that, that sort of section where Austin was starting to sing. Then he made the call. After lunch, we're going to bring in musicians. We're going to go live. So in came um, a double bass, in came the guitars, in came the drums. And we're now letting Austin go. That afternoon was the key because what we witnessed was Elvis Presley. It was just mind-blowing. And at the end of that day, Baz turned to me and said, we are going to do more live than not on this film now. This has proved it. So the 50s, Austin did everything, okay? So all the singing, uh, uh, we had uh, the music department, the props music guys as well, collected all this incredible vintage gear. All the microphones were vintage and retro-fixed and working mics for the periods, you know, from the Shaw 55s through to the RE15, you know, uh, mics and all that sort of stuff that he used in Vegas. Everything was set up for real. So all the dialogue that David Lee was capturing was through those microphones and obviously all the vocals. So, yeah, the 50s, it was all Austin. When it came to the 60s and the and the um, 68 comeback special, etc. That was Elvis. That was when we started to get real Elvis in there. And obviously there's enhancements to the musical, the instrumentation of the of the track. There's enhancements to it. There's also Austin in there, weaving in and out of it. So sometimes where Elvis went off mic, Austin filled it. And it, we didn't want to like, you know, things like the 68 comeback special, it's so well known. It was kind of, I know Austin could have done it. And I sort of like to this day wish that was... <laughs> that was available or, or, or that might have been in the movie. But in the end, it was so wonderful now to have the real Elvis and Austin merging. And then, of course, when we get to the 70s, in the Vegas years, the RCA Masters became available to us where we had the stems. So we had Elvis's vocal separated from the other instrumentation. Things were enhanced, obviously, with the band itself and even with the Sweet Inspirations got zizzed up for the edit itself and for the fact that we're in now we're in a, a, a native Dolby Atmos mix. Things were enhanced, but primarily it's Elvis Presley. During those 70s years, again, weaving of Austin where necessary. So basically you had David Lee carrying 32 channels all the time and marking up instruments and all that sort of thing. So yeah, a massive job. So you can imagine what the dailies were like when they were coming in. I bet. And zizzed up is a new industry term on me. I'm going to remember that one. That's a good one. <laughs> on a related note on the picture side, something that comes up a lot in discussions with editors are reference films. If you're talking to an editor that's doing a sequel or a reboot of an older property, sometimes they'll have the actual, the original film or the, the previous film loaded up in the Avid to reference. Did you actually have the 68 comeback special or Aloha in Hawaii or any previous performances of Elvis that you would use as reference right within the Avid? For sure, Matt. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we used the uh, the 68 special uh, extensively. In fact, we used that as placeholder material for a long time on certain things. While we were shooting it, Baz had a thing, because the 68 special is so well known and so well loved, uh, and Baz wants to be very respectful about people's love for that particular show and that performance. He had a thing called train spotting moments. And certainly the 68 special was, was definitely a train spotting moment. 
uh, from the camera angles to the coverage. We shot everything almost exactly the same on a number of different takes. And then, of course, with today's camera cranes, you, you can kind of add a lot more energy to that. And we certainly did that, too. But uh, the 68 Special and Vegas were very kind of train spottery moments. I also started working on this movie about five years ago, and we did extensive research into not just his concert films, which were, of course, uh, very useful, but also, you know, kind of the, his Hollywood movies and documentaries about Elvis Presley. We were very lucky in, in, in the amount of visual materials that there, that currently exists on, on Elvis. So it was a really useful resource to, uh, to be able to, you know, just reference it and, but also cut sequences, you know, previous sequences, storyboard sequences using existing materials. So we did that quite a lot in pre-production. It's funny to hear you say, I started this film five years ago. That's an incredible amount of time. Then, of course, you factor in the pandemic. The pandemic comes up in every discussion we have about films that are coming out this year or last year, and the impact it had on the post-production and production process. Mm. But with Elvis, I think you are in a bit of a unique situation in that when the pandemic first broke, one of the stories that captured everyone's attention was Tom Hanks contracting COVID. That was, yeah. you know, mm. in some ways, he and his wife were the canaries in the proverbial coal mine yeah. in alerting the world like this is really happening because, look, Tom Hanks has this and well, what's going on? Well, he's in Australia doing this Elvis movie. So- that's something where the whole world was aware of what you were doing at the moment. I'd like to get the insider's perspective for you, where you were at in the process and what happened when all of a sudden Tom has COVID. We were literally a week away from shooting. I, I just finished off a, a film prior to joining um, Jono and the crew up on, on the Gold Coast. And, and it was funny, I, I was in LA doing a mix on the previous film I was working on and the director, and I got a news headline saying that the 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 uh, hotel on the Gold Coast uh, was the first place that a, a, a COVID case had been detected. Mm. And I remember saying to the director of the film that I was working on, wow, I'm pretty sure that's where the cast and crew of um, Elvis are staying. <laughs> and he goes, it's where I was staying. Yeah. As it was where John was staying as well. No. And, uh, and, and he said, uh, you know, is that including Tom Hanks? I said, yeah, I think so. I think everyone's staying there. And then uh, the director said to me, you know, if Tom Hanks gets COVID, <laughs> it's going to be a game changer because if Tom Hanks can get it, anyone can get it. Uh, and sure enough, uh, I flew home from LA and just as I left LA, uh, the studios were starting. The, the film I was working on was meant to come out uh, in, a, in a three weeks' time and already the studios, as I left, were saying, you know, if this COVID thing sort of kicks in, we're going to have to start looking at delaying films and that kind of thing. And by the time I arrived home, the film I was working on had been delayed. Uh, and then three days later, I reported for duty up and joined Jono up on the Gold Coast uh, on the Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday night, I went to, checked into my new accommodation and went to bed. And on Thursday morning, we all got a ping, a, a text message saying, don't come to the studio. One of the crew has got COVID. And so Jono and myself and our editorial crew just met at a cafe on the Gold Coast there. Uh, and as we were sitting having breakfast, all of our phones pinged with all the headlines from around the world coming in saying that crew member was Tom Hanks. Um, so the producers uh, uh, very gallantly attempted to to keep going and they rescheduled and um uh, you know, put put a lot of the the big audience extras heavy scenes to uh, down further down the schedule, and they and because no one knew what this thing was all about, and very gallantly did they try and uh, and keep the show on the road, but it soon became obvious that that was the very week that the world changed and started to shut down and so on, uh, and so a week I think it was a week later we were all gathered together and said we've got, it's a force majeure and we have to shut down. So it, yeah, it was it was big. We were we were. It's fair to say that in so many ways that we were right there at the at the precipice of this thing that just went on to change the world. And so we all, you know, John stayed where he was. I I flew back home to Sydney, and we all just went on a on a. I guess it was five months, was it? Um, yeah, it was about that break. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it was sort of. Uh, it was really distressing as well because, you know, we were geared up. You know, and we'd just done these tests that I was just telling you about before with Austin. 
And we thought, wow, you know, and I believe that they, tell me if I'm wrong, but Warner Brothers basically built all the sets and they went around the studio at the Gold Coast there and just put a lock on every door. Yeah. Bang, 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 bang. Yeah. So they just shut it down and Tom and Rita went home and the whole thing. And we thought, is this going to, is this dead, this project? You know, and so it was really quite depressing. But then uh, we heard that Austin refused to leave Australia. And that was the key that I thought that's the key that is going to keep this show on the road. So no matter how long we're looking at this closure, he's not going to go back to California and lose all the work that he's been doing with his uh, movement coach and the dialect coach and the, all that stuff, he was he was Elvis Presley and he was staying mm. and this was going to happen. And so tell me if I'm wrong there, but without Austin, I think this film may never have happened. Oh, for sure, Wayne. I think you're right. Mm. I mean, the silver lining in the five-month lockdown was definitely the extra time Austin had to rehearse, prepare. Uh, he, he was incredibly prepared already, but, you know, an extra five months, you know, kind of sealed the deal. And he was just a force of nature. It also gave Baz a bit more time to uh, kind of work on the script and, uh, you know, kind of get to a, a better place with the script. So, you know, th- there was a couple of silver linings. It was pretty traumatizing, as, as everyone said, nerve wracking, because we didn't know if the studio might just, you know, cut their losses and put this one to bed. But uh, but fortunately, as, as Wayne said, Having Austin as an anchor for this project, uh, he just kept working. And uh, I think the results are self-evident on the screen. Hats off also to Tom Hanks. There was a, a little question mark as to whether he might go home and the fact that he stayed committed and he recovered and way waited out the lockdown and, and did come back was also a, a huge, a huge help. Yeah. Committed is a great word to use in this situation for everybody. Picture editing and sound design, editing and mixing, you know, those are rarely truly linear processes of the work you all do overlaps and influences one another. But for a film like Elvis, I can't imagine you not being right on top of each other. Um, you know, the music is almost nonstop. The editing itself, very highly stylized visual transitions that you're now known for and the work you do with Baz. And those transitions are generally accompanied by some kind of sound sting. So how did working on Elvis differ from, for example, the work you did together or your process together on The Great Gatsby? How do the picture and sound departments collaborate in a way that might have been different than what you're used to? From Jono's and my standpoint, one of the huge virtues of this movie was that we were up, as I mentioned, up on the Gold Coast. And once the shoot finished, we went into post up on the Gold Coast. And we were set up in this very standalone premises. Wayne aside, we were all together. So there was editorial. The music department was literally in the room next door. Uh, visual effects was down the hall, the art department, the graphics department were upstairs. And we were just all under this one roof. And under that one roof, this just, uh, you know, the alchemy happened. Uh, we, 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 Jono and I could throw cuts to the music guys and they could immediately apply uh, their work to it. Uh, similarly, they were always noodling away on various mashups and, and, uh, and, the, and the, 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 the songs you hear in the film you know, and more. And they could throw it to us and, and, and we could, it was, it was very, a very organic process, which is something that Baz always strives for in all of his movies, mm-hmm. but just geographically, it really sort of came, the dream came true uh, on this film. And we had a big theater also and under the roof of this one place. So we could go and road test things that we were doing on a big screen, a beautiful big screen that was sort of decorated with um, the furnishings of Elvis and the, and the carpet and the curtains from Elvis's hotel suite. It was really a, a magic place to work. And then, of course, because uh, of border lockdowns and things, we couldn't all be together. So Wayne was in Sydney, but we were constantly, constantly in contact. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Wayne did all, of, which he'll speak to, but all of the temp mixes Wayne did and we linked up to the Gold Coast with Sydney. Um, so it was very much like, even though Wayne wasn't there, Physically, he was very, very much there uh, as part of the team. So it was just magic, Matt. Uh, it really was. You're absolutely right to, to point out the fact that we were, it's not, it wasn't a John and I have locked the picture now, here you go, Wayne. Yeah. Very, very far from, as you've heard, Wayne was very, Wayne was very much around for, for, post, uh, for pre-production and just stayed part of it. So we were all together and just it was a very, very organic process, which we all loved. And I know Baz 
loved as well. Yeah, I was worried that we were stuck in Sydney and I wasn't allowed to go to the Gold Coast during that period because of the border closures and things. But I think Matt was here with us during the shoot in an editorial sense. Jono was up on the Gold Coast during the shoot. And so we were already in a full circle. So even while Matt's upstairs cutting, he would call us up in the afternoon and say, check out these rushes. And every time it, <laughs> it blew me away. So we started doing a few tests. So Matt upstairs would give me a scene. There was a wonderful scene, which it still breaks my heart that it's been cut down so much. Thanks, guys. Is Can't Help Falling in Love. Mm. Uh, was known as the beehive sequence. It's the one where he comes off stage in Vegas and all the women start kissing him. That's the full song. that They've shot the full deal. And obviously they've cut it down to just a minutiae of the song, which is obviously one of my many, one of my great favourite mm -hmm. songs as well. So we started a process of that to test the crowds out because the crowds were so, so important for the emotional intent for the characters and to create the live feel. So the audience, is, you know, hopefully is going to feel like they were at the concerts. So that was really big. So we started doing the tests with that, getting crowds together at that time. Again, pandemic, really difficult. But hats off to the production when it all did, in fact, happen, where they would have 500 extras, all clean and clear of viruses. David Lee uh, managed to capture a lot of stuff on uh, ambisonic mics for us, where there was that number, which was great. So that was happening. I think in terms of the collaboration, obviously Matt, Jono and I go back a long way and we were constantly on the phone, kind of keeping up with it. Where Baz wasn't available to me, let's say, because he's so busy, these guys were always keeping me in the loop of where the iterations were happening. And Baz's editorial process is one very much one of iteration. One week you've got this scene, the next week you don't, or you've got half of it or, or it's broken into 20 pieces. So you had to continually be on your toes and pivot. With the music department, we were constantly feeding each other on the side where the musical infrastructure was heading, both tonally, harmonically, and rhythmically. So they would be calling for me to supply uh, sound design elements for them to even put into the music. There was one point where the, the first daytime Bill Street walk was uh, going to be a little like uh, Baby Driver, where sound effects are all happening in time. In fact, a lot of that sound design is still in play and still in time. It's just not so uh, so obvious. But that sort of that sort of constant. We had the music department and us working independently on the side, making sure that we're all in in in, in harmony and in key, and. Uh, then the editorial standpoint, keeping up with the the iterative versions of, of, of the cuts, we were ahead of it. Because we were going in, we did four recruit temp mixes, right? In fact, I did five mixes, but the, the four big recruit ones for audience previews, they sort of grew and grew. So what we were doing was we were adding and we were making better every time, make better, make better, make better. So nothing was ever thrown away. And also the prospect of the future to whether Baz might actually make this into a HBO miniseries, <laughs> mm -hmm. we have kept everything because hopefully one day that stuff will appear in a long form of serials. Is that on the table? Because that's something when I was watching the film, I was thinking what a great miniseries it would have made as well. It is on the table. Baz has, I think I'm not speaking out of school because Baz has mentioned it in, in recent um, interviews that he uh, is in talks with HBO with Warner Brothers. Now, I don't imagine it's going to come anytime soon because of uh, exhaustion factors, but, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and obviously there is a big budgetary deal to that because the editorial will tell you, these guys will tell you that once you open up a scene where maybe the visual effects aren't complete for the, <laughs> as soon as you trim it out, mm. there's a big uh, price tag uh, attached to that stuff. But the good news is, is that it's all being filmed. When I first went up and saw the uh, director's cut, I think you guys called it the kitchen sink. Yeah. Um, edit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was that was running. Well, I thought it was about five hours, but you reckon it was four mm -hmm. and a half. Uh, four it was about four and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an extraordinary experience. We had a little intermission, which which was nice. But by the end of the the whole run, 
uh, and being invited in to see that that, that um, full deal, it was absolutely mind blowing. And so that was look, just winding up all that stuff in terms of collaboration. That's how it worked in Sydney. All of my team who were extraordinary. We did the same thing. We were immersed in Elvis paraphernalia. Every room was covered in posters and, you know, we played music in the corridors. It, it, we were, it was total immersion because for me, even with my crew who are just absolutely awesome, it's about the journey mm. as well of the filmmaking experience and, you know, and going down the Elvis rabbit hole was just so great. So, yeah, we, we were completely immersed and didn't feel the distance you know, we just had to pivot and make it make it work with communication. Mm. It's impossible to make a Baz Luhrmann movie without picture, music, sound, and also the art department and visual effects all working in lockstep. We'd still be finishing the movie now if 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 all of us didn't work so well together. Yeah, yeah. the The original assembly was four hours twenty minutes long, and much to Jono's and my chagrin. Baz opened it up to uh, – because it was called the kitchen sink because everything was in it, including the kitchen sink, mm. and it was very much a, you know, an assembly. But Baz, because he's, he's incredibly collaborative and uh, he invited a lot of the, uh, the HODs in to have a look at it, and it, and it did play. It really did play. It, oh, it sure did. It buoyed us quite a bit because, uh, because we knew that we had something the, – the, the challenge, of course, was to get it down to a, to a theatrically releasable length but at least we knew we had an, a, a fantastic lump of clay to work with. Oh, yeah, it was like you, you guys were used to the footage during the shoot, but I tell you, for someone like myself that walked in and saw this incredible story play out, it was just mind-blowing. And to see Austin and Tom and everyone and, you know, these sets and, the, you know, the story elements that never made the final feature film, I still to this day think of those sequences that are not there and, and how heartbreaking they were when they went. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, I'm going to start the uh, release the kitchen sink cut on social media. <laughs> as well. Work the back. Keep an eye out for that. When we started talking, I, I made the point about how I think they used the word fluid, the style of the editing in this film. And when there is multiple editors on a film, generally I ask about uh, distribution of the workload and it's, it's, Pretty much like, okay, you take this scene, I'll take that scene, or you take this reel. You do the concert stuff, I'll do the dramatic stuff. But again, with the style that you employ, I can't quite wrap my head around how you two collaborate because everything just flows from one thing to another. It's a constant state of transition. I think fluid, you mentioned the word fluid. Uh, I, th- I think that that is key. There was a lot of back and forth uh, of sequences. We obviously kind of broke up the assembly work between us during the shoot. And after that, once Baz became involved in the cut, it was anything goes really. You know, there's probably very few scenes in the movie where both of us didn't have our fingerprints all over it. You know, it was just very fluid. There was a lot of back and forth uh, between myself and Matt. Scenes that may have existed in different parts of the movie, then through the process of the cut became intercut weaves. So when that happens, you just can't be precious at all, particularly with, with a Baz Luhrmann film. He just doesn't care who does the work as long as it gets done and, and, and he's happy with it. Well, I can see why. The work turns out pretty great. As much as I have made a point about the pace, the tempo of this film, where it does lay back, where it does slow down, a lot of times in the concerts. So I'd just like to know a little bit about the comparison of cutting the narrative part of it, which again moves very quickly, and then the concert part of it, which you give a little more breath to. And I would assume you're working with more cameras, you're working with more elements. But rather than assume, I'll just ask you, how did it compare working on the narrative stuff to the concert stuff? Um, a humongous multicam concert piece or a little two-hander. They've, they've each got, each has their own challenges of, of how to make a play and how to, to say, stay emotionally on point and so on. With the concert footages, of uh, concert sequences rather, every, every set piece had a purpose in the story. Uh, so the, the very first Hayride performance, that was all about telling us, us, the audience, that this guy was unleashed on stage for the first time and the, the way he captured uh, all audiences, but particularly the screaming girls that we had. The purpose of that scene and that story was to, to show what Elvis was made of and, how he, and, the, and the, what he unleashed for the first time on the world during that time so you know there was a freneticism to the 
to the way we cut that and uh, and we had lots of every 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 concert just so you know was was shot very conventionally it was multi camera and just played the whole song out from the start to finish but then with that raw material came the challenge of of telling the story that the that, that piece of music was was meant to convey so then mm. it was the energy of of the hayride when we got to Russwood, it was all about the defiance of the colonel. So you sort of lulled the audience into a false sense of security, thinking that uh, you know, Elvis's big speech about you know you've got to trust the people you love and all that kind of thing. Cut to Colonel, sort of with a little thank you smile on his face, and then Elvis starts singing, and it's slow to begin with, but then he starts his wiggles and things, and then you realise the defiance is on. So then, and then you, you just mm-hmm. went wild with him diving into the mosh pit and all that sort of stuff. And then the uh, comeback special, obviously, it was a big narrative drive to to once again see that the colonel was was uh, arguing with the, the senior executives upstairs while Elvis was performing downstairs. Baz is the master of cramming maximum amounts of narrative into minimum screen time, mm-hmm. um, so it was, it was always it was always a challenge and. A, required great agility to sort of jump from 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 one thing to the other and and give each thing uh you know you, you could you, there's a version of the film that could always just be on the audience reactions or just on what colonel was up to up in the control room or there's another version where it just you just stayed on elvis the entire time and, and each would be as entertaining mm. as the other um mm. uh but of course you know you, you need to keep the two the two narrative streams going and then of course you get to vegas and the signing of the contract on the napkin while elvis is on stage performing but when you get to the vegas years particularly for that rehearsal the 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 first scene and the first song in vegas we could afford just to sort of relax and show more of the music so it it, it was just a matter of responding to what the narrative requirement of each set piece was and then, of course, the drama scenes, they were challenging in their own way just to always stay emotionally on point and just to keep check of what the colonel was up to and how evil was he or was he just kind of, you know, you, you, need, you need to keep him as someone who loved Elvis but, uh, but just dial in or out the amount of evil manipulation that, uh, that you saw playing out on screen. So each scene's a challenge, but they're equally fun and we were very spoilt for choice with the extraordinary performances we had to work with. You know, Wayne talked about, or I asked Wayne about the blending of Austin's vocals and Elvis's vocals and then just Elvis visually. Obviously, it's Austin through most of the film, but there are times when it is actually Elvis. Mm. And I think there are going to be times where people assume it's Elvis and it's not, or they think it's Austin and it's actually Elvis. I swear I saw a shot in the Aloha concert I thought was really Elvis. I could be wrong. Mm. You'd be right. You'd be right. (laughs) I I could be right. So, you know, it's become an Easter egg of sorts to spot the real Elvis in the film. What was the thinking or what rhyme or reason did you apply as to when we're going to use the real Elvis versus Austin? Well, we definitely wanted to be a very subtle thing. We wanted to be quite subliminal. Austin did such a, an amazing job in, in kind of what Baz referred to as basically signing the contract with the audience, convincing the audience that he's not an actor playing Elvis, he is Elvis. And out of respect to the work that Austin did, we really didn't want to kind of take the audience away from Austin by kind of overtly cutting to, to Elvis too much. There is probably a lot more of the real Elvis in the movie than you uh, you might think. <laughs> uh, he appears basically all the way through it, obviously overtly at the very end of the movie in Unchained Melody, and that was a very deliberate decision to, you know, basically hand over from from Austin to the real Elvis, give Elvis the final word. Well, it was a very effective. I can just tell you from my experience seeing the film. Now I saw it with a bunch of old geezers, so we were all you know big <laughs> Elvis fans and. <laughs> But that, that moment at the end, there, there was an wow. audible gasp in the audience of when Elvis comes on because you've done such a wonderful job of bringing him back throughout the film that when you see the, the real man again... That's heartbreaking. It is. It is. And it's... Um, I mean, I can't think of a great way to wrap up this interview other than just to say I thought you did an amazing job. It's a fantastic film. That's my take, and I think everybody should go see it. No, no, thank you, Matt. Me. Yeah, man. Matt, thank you so much for that. That's, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Come on, who's with me on the Release the Kitchen Sink Cut movement? We should all be in on that one, because you can never get enough great material when it comes to studying the art and science of editing and sound design. Those are my favorite people right there. I bet they're yours too. Which is why I'd like you to join me in thanking Matt, Jono, and Wayne for talking with us today about their amazing work on Elvis. 
I really did enjoy this film quite a lot, and if you haven't yet, I hope you do check it out as well. Hey, have you checked out the latest version of Avid Media Composer for me yet? No? Well, don't be cruel. See, I told you I wasn't done with the Elvis jokes. But you are only hurting yourself if you're not up to speed on all that Media Composer can offer to you as an editor. It could not be easier for you to try, and it could not be more affordable for you to buy. And they better not try and make it any more affordable, otherwise I'm going to have to start walking to work. So get on over to Avid.com and check out all the latest news on the NLE that Matt and Jono used to cut Elvis. Speaking of Elvis, I hear he has just left the building, and I'm right behind him. So until we meet again, my friends, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>